Sir, can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And this morning we're going to hear from Mr. Bulk. Yeah. Can I I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall. Give, that the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mason. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can you give your full name, please? Uh, Andrzej Conrad Bols, known as Andrew. Thank you very much, Mr. Bols. Um, you should have in front of you a bundle containing a witness statement behind tab A. Yes. Um, is that statement dated the 28th of November 2023? It is. Thank you. Could I ask you to turn to the final substantive page? That's page 19. Yes. Um, can you confirm that that is your signature? It is. And is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Uh, it, it is. Um, can I say I need to make an amendment in relation to one aspect of it? Uh, relates to paragraph 29 and 46. Uh, thank you very much. Those are paragraphs relating to your knowledge of bugs, errors, or defects in the Horizon system. Uh, can you just clarify for us what is the amendment that you would like to make? Um, Subsequent to this statement, I received further uh, documentation, including an email I was copied into. Uh, it related to the case of Wiley. In that, it mentioned uh, that in the instance of a terminal failure, the transaction, that instant transaction, wouldn't be recorded. Uh, and to that extent, I, I suspect that would be counted as potentially a defect in the system. Thank you very much. Um, that witness statement, WITN 09670100, um, is now in evidence and will be published on the inquiry's website in due course. Thank you. Um, I want to begin today by um, asking you about your background. You joined Cartwright King in 2006 as an assistant solicitor, is that correct? Correct. Uh, were you a solicitor somewhere else before, or was that your first job as a solicitor? Yes, I, I, I worked as a solicitor from qualification in 1995 uh, at a different firm. Thank you. Uh, up until you joined Cartwright King? Yes. yes. Uh, and was that in a role involving prosecutions or defence or uh, something else? Criminal else? legal aid defence work. Thank you. Um, you were promoted to senior associate shortly after you joined Cartwright King? Yes. Uh, and you spent several years in the Higher Courts Advocacy Department, is that correct? Correct. And then you joined, um, I think, what you've called the Private Prosecutions Department. Is that correct? Yes. Can you recall what year it was that you joined that Private Prosecutions Department? 2012. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and were there a number of different private prosecutions that were carried out by Cartwright King within that department? So um, one of the uh, directors of the firm had previous experience of prosecutions uh, with... Um, the Royal Mail Group um, and the RSPCA uh, Environment Agency uh, and maybe some others. Thank you. Um, how many of you were involved in post office prosecutions? Um, there was uh, a director overseeing uh, matters, uh, myself, um, Martin Smith, um, and a couple of in-house counsel um, throughout the period, other people would come in and out to do pieces of work. So you said there was somebody supervising. Who, who was that? Well, I, would, I don't know about supervising, but uh, the director was Andy Cash. Um, thank you. Did you report directly to Andy Cash? Um, or was there somebody in between the two of you? Potentially Martin Smith and then Andy Cash, maybe, maybe in, that, in, in that order. 
Um, and in terms of people who are directly involved in post office prosecutions, we have yourself. Um, you've mentioned Andy Cash. I think you've mentioned Martin Smith. Is that correct? Correct. Um, we'll see the name Rachel Panter. Yes. Can you assist us with who she was? Uh, I believe she was an assistant solicitor at the time. Um, she helped with um, the evidence provided by Gareth Jenkins, <coughs> primarily, I believe, uh, and some casework assistance. Did you supervise her, or was there a working <coughs> relationship between the two of you? Um, well, we worked together. I, I wasn't her supervisor. Um, you were the senior associate. She was, I think you said, an assistant solicitor at that time. Yes. Was there somebody who you both um, reported to or supervised the two of you together? Um, I I'm, don't recall a, a specific supervision structure. Um, so that's three, four names. W were there more people involved in post office prosecutions? Um, on an ad hoc basis, there were some others I, I don't recall. Uh, there was some in-house counsel, um, so Mr. Clark, Mr. Bowyer some other in-house counsel on occasion, I believe. So one of those is Harry Bowyer, is that correct? Correct. What was your relationship with Mr. Bowyer? In, in, sorry, in what respect? It, did you work next to each other in the same room? So I uh, worked uh, out of uh, the Leicester office, uh, by myself primarily, um, and Mr. Smith worked in Derby, um, I believe uh, the others were based in Derby, certainly from July 2013. I can't be certain where they were based before that. And was there a reason why you were based in a separate office at all? Uh, I, I had always worked in Leicester. Were there others working on the post office prosecutions in Leicester with you? Um, no, I believe my trainee at that time at some point uh, got involved uh, and assisted with attending court on a, a, a one or two cases potentially thank you were there regular meetings between those who prosecuted on the post office's behalf there were meetings um, I, I can't say that they were regular um, most of the communication would have been potentially via email or over the phone was there somebody who took responsibility for training you all or informing you all? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. You've described in your witness statement as acting as an agent for the post office. Yes. What did you understand acting as an agent to mean? I, I think I said in my statement that the role was quite unspecified and it, and it wasn't clear exactly uh, where our duties started and ended in terms of the overall uh, prosecutions. Was there somebody who informed you about um, the role that you were to play? Um, in, in what respect? Well, let, let's take Cartwright King on the one hand. Was there somebody at Cartwright King who said that you, um, as an agent, played a particular role or were governed by a particular policy? Uh, no, not that, not that I recall. Um, who did you consider to be the prosecutor for the purposes of the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act? Well, the prosecuting authority uh, I considered to be Post Office Limited. Um, did you consider yourself to be bound by the same regulatory framework uh, and standards um, when you were acting for the post office as when you were acting for other private prosecutors? I would have thought so, yes. Can you assist us with understanding the relationship between Cartwright King and the post office in terms of delineation of responsibilities at all? Uh, I, as I say, I, I think that was very blurred uh, as far as I was concerned. Um, Let's take as an example a um, disclosure schedule. Did you see that as your responsibility or the responsibility of the post office? Well, the disclosure schedules in the cases I dealt with were sent to me, so I, I, I took responsib responsibility for them, yes. In terms of your relationship with the post office, was there somebody in particular who you liaised with? 
the head of the criminal law team was John L. Singh, so he was uh, my main point of contact with the post office. Um, were, were there others who you liaised with that you can recall? The investigators. Thank you. Um, do you remember when you first met John L. Singh at all? Um, I remember where I met him. It, it was at the Derby office. Uh, I'd been called there for a, a meet and greet session, I believe, with him. Um, so I think you said you joined in 2012. Was it February, March 2012? Yes. From the documentation I've seen, it was around that time, yes. And is it around that time that you met John L. Singh for the first it, time? It must have been pretty soon afterwards. I can't say when. Um, did you have any views as to his abilities? Uh, yes, I did. And can you assist us with what those might have been? Um, I wondered how he was in the position he was. And why do you say that? I'm not sure he was suited to the responsibilities that he had. Um, can you elaborate a little more? Um, it's I difficult to say, really. I, I just. I mean, you're, you're being quite diplomatic. Yes. Um, was there anything about his um, abilities as a lawyer that you had concerns about? I, I wasn't sure about his abilities, no. Uh, and how about his conduct as a lawyer? Um, again, at times, um, it, it did raise an eyebrow. Can, can you give us an example? I'm struggling to give you a specific example, um, but perhaps some of the language he used. Uh, and what do you mean by that? Um, he liked to keep things very simple. Um, in terms of his understanding of the computer system, he, he described it as a, I believe, a, a fancy computer. Um, it adds money in, it, it deducts money going out. What could go wrong, I think, was a phrase he used, which I thought was somewhat of an oversimplification. Thank you. Sometimes we've heard in this inquiry reference to a calculator. Did you mean computer or did you mean calculator? I'm, sorry, calculator, yes. A, a fancy calculator is how he described it. Thank you. A paragraph two of your witness statement, you've said, I was told that I would be assisted by experienced investigators. Um, you say you were told that you would be assisted by experienced investigators. Are we to read anything into um, your choice of words in your statement? Um, no, exactly that. Um, but was the reality any different? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, well, they were certainly experienced, I, I believe, yes. I think you're suggesting perhaps that experience doesn't equate to competence. Is that what I'm to read into? I'm not sure I would go that far, but um, perhaps they were set in a certain way of doing things, yes. And um, which way was that? Um, well, in terms of their investigation of the cases, perhaps wasn't as thorough as could have been. Was that something that you were concerned about at the time, or is that a, a later realisation? Uh, I think it became a, a, a later realisation, yes. You also have said in your witness statement that the post office regularly instructed counsel that were familiar with the prosecutions. Yes. Um, did that also turn out to be incorrect, or was that a, a fair summary of the position? In, in the cases I dealt with, um, the counsel instructed was John Gibson, and I, I understood that he dealt with a number of these cases before. And do you have any views as to his conduct of the cases that he dealt with for you? Um, not, not, not particularly that I recall. Um, I, I never met him in person. Um, so. um, I want to ask you in general terms about the prosecutions that you had conduct of. Um, you say that the first green jacket files were passed to you in March 2012. Can you assist us with what a green jacket file is? Uh, I believe it was the uh, investigator's um, investigation file. Uh, essentially, it contained uh, what I believe to be the documents uh, that had been amassed during their, the course of their investigation, including a, an, an investigator's report and um, a, a letter from the business unit. 
Would you receive that directly from the investigator, from the business unit, or from a lawyer? It just arrived on my desk. I don't know. In, in hard copy? In hard copy, indeed, yes. I think you've said your first case was in March 2012, is that correct? Or? I believe so, yes. We're going to come to case studies at this, probably later this morning. Um, Sefton and Neild and also the case of Allen. Yes. Um, were they your first or was there an earlier case that you were involved in? They were the first, uh, or the very first handful of cases I gave advice on. Uh, there was a case of Bramwell, which uh, seemed to be coming to its, its conclusion, uh, and that was included with the pile of cases that I was given. Do you think Bramwell was probably the first prosecution that you were involved in in that case? Yes. Um, let's start by looking at a Bramwell um, chain of emails. Can we look at FUJ 00156530? And if we could start looking at page three, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, we have there an email from Emma Haley at Stone King. Can you assist us with what the relationship was with Stone King? Um, I think they'd been instructed uh, by the post office uh, to deal with the case locally. Um, so despite both having the name King in your... <laughs> no titles, relation, yes. No, no relationship no. at all. Um, did you, did you, as a firm, assist Stone King? Did they assist you? Did they pass cases on to you? Uh, as far as I can recall, this was the only case that we had uh, any dealings with them. Okay. Um, this email, 13th of March, so that's, one of, that's pretty early on in your time. Absolutely, yes. Um, and she says... It's about the case of Bramwell, and she says, Council would bluntly like Fujitsu to pour as much cold water as possible on the defence report. If the expert is saying we cannot disagree with anything at all, then we are potentially in some difficulty. I've asked Council to provide a specific list of questions, but really the essence is how much, if anything, can we rebut, uh, and can we explain the accounting system to a jury in the way they will find easy to understand? Um, so it looks as though, from a very early stage, you're being made aware that there are issues being raised in a prosecution regarding the Fujitsu horizon system. Yes, you could say that, yes. Um, there's then reference to barrister training in Cardiff. This is an email we've seen before in this inquiry. Um, are, are you aware of what that involved at all? No. Um, if we scroll up, you then send the email to Graham Brander, uh, who's the security manager at the post office. I think he was the investigator. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and you say, could you see if Fujitsu can work with these rather vague instructions? Otherwise, I think the only uh, way forward is for you to meet with Sue as soon as possible to help her understand the system and iron out the specifics. Um, if we scroll up, on the second page, thank you. Um, there is then an email from Graham Brander to Penny Thomas at Fujitsu, um, who points her to the email below, and he says, Council would like Gareth to advise on what from the defence expert report faxed to you last week that he's able to rebut, if anything. Um, so quite early on in your career at Cartwright King, it seems as though you are having some sort of involvement with Gareth Jenkins, is that Yes, right? it is. Thank you. I'd like to move on to another email, and that's poll 00096464. We're sticking still with the case of Bramwell. <coughs> Thank you. If we look at the bottom email on that page, um, we have Rachel Panter. So you've said she was the um, associate solicitor at Cartwright King, or assistant I, solicitor. Sorry. I think so. I'm not sure exactly what, what her title was. Um, 10th of April, she is sending you um, emails regarding Chris Bramwell. And if we scroll down, that includes... Um, if we scroll down to the bottom of the second page, 
a chain from Gareth Jenkins, who says, I was asked a couple of weeks ago about papers covering horizon integrity. I have a couple of such papers, and it has now been agreed I can pass them on to you. And there are two papers that he is attaching there, one on horizon integrity and the other on horizon online integrity. Yes. Um, one further document I'd like to look at, and that is poll 0005816. We're now moving to June 2012. Um, this is, I'll take you to the case studies in due course, but I'm yes. just looking in very broad terms about the kinds of issues that were cropping up quite early on in your time at Cartwright King. Um, the bottom of page one, we have an email of the 12th of June from Rachel Panter um, to yourself and Andy Cash and Martin Smith. And she says, uh, I've, dear all, I have saved a copy on my personal file of a Fujitsu report which covers all aspects to do with the integrity of the Horizon system. I think we forgot that we had this, and they're very expensive to have done. Luckily, it's a generic report that is not specific to one particular case um, and will be able to assist you when drafting advices where the integrity of the Horizon system um, can be called into question. Um, I'll scan and save a copy of the post office file for you um, to access when needed. We have the case, and this is the case of Wiley. I know it's redacted there. We actually have an unredacted version which will be uploaded um, to the document management system in due course for um, core participants to view. Um, in Newcastle at the moment, where council has encountered problems with defence solicitors in the past, uh, where they've questioned the Horizon system, and unfortunately, due to not having any evidence to rebut such criticisms, had to drop the case against them. Uh, this report should hopefully prevent that from happening. Um, and if we scroll on the first page to the substantive email halfway down that page. Um, just pausing there, actually. The, the Horizon Integrity uh, the report that she's referring to, mm. do you recall that document? No. no. I'm not sure if it's the same one that was subsequently served or not. There's a later document that we'll come to, mm. um, but this is June 2012. Um, how about the case of Wiley in the Newcastle case? Was that something that you were aware of? Uh, only in the sense of being referred to it in this email chain, um, but otherwise not. Um, issues about the cost of obtaining a report from Fujitsu. Is that something that you were familiar with? Certainly became aware of that, yes. You became aware of that? Yes. Um, we'll see in due course various emails on that. Uh, approximately when do you think you became aware of the cost issues? Well, it could have been triggered by this email, I suppose. Thank you. Um, did you have a view or do you have a view on using a generic report to rebut the um, criticisms of the integrity of the Horizon system? Well, I think each, each case was specific, so uh, I would have thought any report would have needed to address those specifics to be of any worth. If we look at that top email, we have uh, from Andy Cash to all, pros all dot prosecution. So was that a generic email address for everybody involved in post office prosecutions, or was that the post office, the, the prosecution's team in general at Cartwright King? Uh, I think they would have overlapped. Yes. She says, I, I mean, he says, I copy this to all prosecution team for info. Uh, Rachel, Martin, and Andy B have most of the work in hand now, and we're building some good relationships with officers. Uh, Rachel, excellent. Well done on securing this resource. And then he talks about a chat with Jarnel Singh. Um, it, it seems as though Rachel, Martin, and yourself are identified as those with um, most of the work in, in that area. Is yes. that a, a fair yes. description? It is. Yeah. 
I'd now like to move to July, so the next month in 2012. And can we look at poll 00026567, please? This is an advice written by Harry Bowyer, who I think you've said was a, a, an advocate. A, a, he was a barrister employed by Cartwright King. In-house barrister, yes. In-house barrister, thank you. Um, do you remember this advice at all? No. no. Um, I'd like to take you through the advice and just see what you recall of the contents of the advice in terms of broad picture, having yes. been at Cartwright King at the relevant time. Can, can I just say, I've just seen this this morning. Yes. But, yeah. um, I'm going to start on paragraph one. Um, th this is talking about the Wiley case, so that's the Newcastle case that we've just been looking at in emails. And he says as follows, he says, in interviews she attempted to blame the shortfall on the Horizon accounting system. In my early advice I advised that we would need to prove the integrity of the Horizon system as there was um, apocryphal evidence on the internet and elsewhere that the system was leading to injustice. Now I had to look up the word apocryphal. <laughs> means doubtful authenticity. <laughs> um, do you recall that being the view of your colleagues at Cartwright King at the relevant time? That, that around summer of 2012, um, there was evidence of doubtful authenticity on the internet and elsewhere? Yes, I, I would have been aware of that. Uh, I can't say exactly when, but yes. Uh, but pretty, soon, pretty soon into the process, yeah. And was the view of your colleagues, uh, and perhaps yourself, that that evidence on the internet was not of substance? I'm not sure if I had a view on that. Um, I tried to deal with the evidence that was presented to me rather than rely on what the internet said. But if you believed what was on the internet, no doubt that would have been a very serious matter, wouldn't it? Uh, of concern, absolutely, yes. So were you not concerned about it as at the summer of 2012? Yes. Yes, you were concerned or weren't? Yeah, yes. You, you were concerned about problems with Horizon in the summer of 2012? Yes. 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 Um, paragraph two, please. The position of Post Office Limited has, up until now, always been robust. When the system has been challenged in the criminal courts, the system has always been successfully defended. I understand that the Post Office has announced that it has appointed independent forensic accountant Second Sight Limited to conduct an independent review of 10 cases based on the Horizon system. Uh, whether this announcement was well considered or not uh, is not an area that I intend to address, but the bell cannot be unrung and there will be consequences uh, that will have to be dealt with. Um, were you aware at that time of concerns at Cartwright King about the consequences of the second site investigation? I, I don't recall exactly when I knew that that second site investigation had begun. Yes. If we say broadly the summer of 2012, so um, six months or less into your time at Cartwright King, were you aware yes. of concerns about the impact of the second site investigation or potential impact? Of yes, the yes, at some point, yes. Thank you. If we could now look at paragraph three. He says, the first consequence is that we have now give, given ammunition to those attempting to discredit the Horizon system. Uh, the argument will be that there is no smoke without fire and we would not have needed to audit a bomb-proof system. Uh, we can expect this to go viral in that any competent defence solicitor advising in a case such as this will raise the integrity of, Horizon, of the Horizon system and put us to proof as to its integrity. Um, is that a concern that you shared at that time? It was a concern that was filtered through to me, uh, and hence the need to get a, an, an, a, a report from someone to say that the system was robust, yes. Um, are you able to assist us with 
how it was filtered to you. I can't recall. If we look at paragraph four, please. Paragraph four says, the extra evidence which we will be obliged to gather uh, will be as nothing in comparison to the potential disclosure problems that we may face. Until the second site investigation is concluded, we will be in a, a limbo. Um, was that a concern that you had at that time? Did you, did you consider that there may be implications as to whether or not to actually proceed at all with prosecutions whilst the second site investigation was ongoing? In terms of staying the proceedings uh, and the like, is that what you mean? Yes. I have to be honest, it's not something I'd considered personally. Um, I would have thought that would have been a decision taken at a higher level within, within the post office. Um, the disclosure problems that we may face, though, were something that you were aware of. The potential implications for disclosure of Second Sight's investigation, was, a, was a, that a firm-wide concern? I, I can't be sure. Can we look at paragraph five, please? Paragraph five says, I assume that we still contend that the system is foolproof, in which case we should defend it aggressively. Pausing there, did you consider that it was appropriate for a prosecutor to defend the Horizon system aggressively? Do you think that's an appropriate term to use for a prosecutor? Um, possibly not, no. Um, I understand that the manufacturers have not been helpful up until now. My understanding is that they will not provide expert evidence without large fees being sought. Uh, that's something we discussed um, earlier about costs of yes. assistance. And it certainly was an issue, yes. yes. Um, this will not do. If the integrity of the system is compromised, then the consequences will be catastrophic for all of us, including them. Um, just pausing there, all of us. Uh, I, were you aware at that time of general concerns uh, within Cartwright King of the implications for the firm itself? Um, I think I was aware it was a hot potato, if I could put it that way. The financial consequences of convictions and confiscation orders being overturned and confidence in the post office bookkeeping being restored for future prosecutions will be astronomical they should be made to understand that this is a firefighting situation and it's not just our house that will be burned down if the system were compromised. Again, our house... Um, I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not asking you to interpret his words, but the feel of this advice is that there were serious concerns within Cartwright King about the implications for the firm. Did you understand that feeling at the time? Um. I'm, I'm not sure that I did in that sense. I, I knew that uh, this was a, uh, a serious issue. Um, if we go down to paragraph six, please. He makes three recommendations of things that he uh, considers should be done. Uh, the first is we should identify the contested cases, civil and criminal, in which the horizon system has been challenged, we should identify the areas of challenge and how we neutralize them. Um, an expert, any expert reports should be retained for evaluation. An expert should be identified and instructed to prepare a generic statement which confirms the integrity of the system and why the attacks so far have been unfounded. This expert should be deployed in all cases where the horizon system is challenged and he should be prepared to call, uh, be called to reply to defence experts on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, is that something at that time that you were aware of, that there was a proposal for a generic statement to be obtained from an expert? Uh, I was aware that they needed to get a statement. I, I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be generic or not. The second recommendation, the material gathered should be monitored and added added on a case-by-case -case basis for disclosure. Um, it would be sensible to have a nominated individual in charge 
uh, to whom the case officers can come, there's little point in weaving a web without having a spider in it. Um, the material should be monitored and added on a case-by-case -case basis for disclosure. Were you aware of a central hub that was developing for disclosure purposes? Um, no. Um, third, he, he said this. He said, uh, we should ascertain why we have decided to instruct Second Sight Limited. Just pausing there, the, the use of, you will see the use of we and are quite often there. Um, at Cartwright King, was it common to refer to um, us when talking about post office prosecutions, or, or was there something? I'm not sure, to be honest. No. Yeah. Um, I presume that it was not because of any doubts that we had in our system. Um, if so, we should be robust in stating that is so. I presume our thinking was uh, that as we have nothing to hide, we have no objection to our practices being scrutinised, in which cases, uh, in which case we should say so. And he finishes on paragraph seven by saying, I can appreciate that the above might be expensive, uh, but it will be as nothing should the integrity of the horizon system be compromised. It, it seems from this advice that a colleague of yours was seriously worried about the horizon system being undermined. Um, hmm. Was that a concern that was widely shared with your small group of colleagues? Sorry, in what sense? Um, the concern uh, set out in quite strong terms in this advice, but irrespective of the terms, uh, was the um, challenge to the integrity of the horizon system something that featured quite prominently amongst the team at Cartwright King? Well, I would have thought so, because a lot of the prosecutions were based on, on, on the evidence of the system. I mean, let's look at briefly at, at another email. Um, it's poll 00141396. Um, this is an email from Andy Cash passing on this advice from Harry Bowyer to Jarnel Singh. Um, it's the same day, and he says, Dear Jarnell, I enclose advice from Harry Bowyer. I know it will be unpalatable, uh, but for what it may be worth, I share his view. So you have Andy Cash and Harry Bowyer, both are of the views expressed in Harry Bowyer's mm. advice. Uh, presumably that was a view that was shared throughout your team. So the view being the serious concern about challenges to the integrity of the Horizon system and, and the need to rebut that as strongly as possible. Well, the system was crucial to, to the prosecution, so yes, in, in that sense. I mean, in that email, there's almost a, a sense of in, in, sorry, in the advice, there's almost a sense of fear, really, for the future. Was that something that was shared throughout your team? I'm not sure the word fear would be appropriate. Uh, well, concern. Concern. Maybe. Yes. Um, concern for the post office, concern for Cartwright King, or concern for something else? Uh, I don't know. C concern that um, the, the system worked? concerned that the system didn't work. Or didn't work, yes, yes. Can we look at UKGI 00001432? This is uh, an email about the case of Ishak. Um, I'm not going to ask you in detail about that case because I think you've said in your witness statement that you don't really recall very much. No. Um, but this is just over a month later. Uh, it's another case that's challenging the Horizon system. So when I say a month later, a month after the previous case that we looked at, it's yes. in the same kind of period that the advice had been written and, and sent on. Um, we have there an email from Martin Smith to Rachel Panter, copied to Andy Cash. Um, and in relation to this case, he says, 
the defendant solicitor made it clear that the functionality of the Horizon system would be an issue. Uh, the defendant has instructed them uh, that the correct amount of money uh, will be there in the account somewhere and that this is an error with Horizon. Everyone has heard about the problems with Horizon. This is going to be another one of those cases uh, where we will have to anticipate and deal with the Horizon issue and consider our approach. Um, talking to Andy Cash, he says, Andy, I think we should draw up a separate list of cases in which we anticipate Horizon arguments uh, so that we can ensure that we have appropriate answers slash material and agreed tactics for the plea and case management hearings, uh, the dates of which will undoubtedly arrive well before the post office are likely to have obtained any reports. Um, if we scroll up, please, we have, this is an email, I think, from Andy Cash, um, that you're uh, an addressee of that email. Yes. And it says, um, Martin, please talk to Andy and Rachel to get a list up. Please also advise Jarnell when reporting that we have another one. Uh, we need to consider counsel in the Bradford case as well. We can't expect HB, I think that's Harry Bowyer, yes. um, to take them all. Rachel, please check availability with um, two other people. Um, do you recall the request to get a list up? Do, do you recall at, at this period a coordination of the various cases and various horizon challenges? A, a list was gathered. Shortly after this, I believe, yes. Uh, were you involved in gathering the list? Um, no. Contributing to it, I suppose, by identifying those particular cases to, to Martin or Rachel. Uh, and did you see the list once it had been compiled? Uh, yes, I've been copied into emails. So I think the, there's a list of cases, relevant cases, yes. Thank you. Um, my final document on your general knowledge uh, in the 2012-2013 period. I'm going to take you to just a, some minutes from a regular call re-horizon issues. That's poll 000 This is just an example. We have many different um, notes from what's called a regular call re-horizon issues. Do you remember uh, when those calls started happening? Um, they were back on the advice prepared by Simon Clark to generate some kind of meeting for information to go sideways through the business rather than up and down, I guess. Um, and you're there listed as the representative from Cartwright King. Is there a reason why you were chosen to take that role? So I sat in on a handful of these hearings uh, when Martin Smith wasn't available. Um, so was Martin Smith was course. the main attendee at these meetings, was he? Yes. Um, if we l look at page three, please, can you give us a, an approximation of how many of these calls you, you think you attended? A handful. A handful being five or thereabouts? Or, yes. Yeah. If you look at page three, just by way of example, we have uh, Rigo's branch there, the third entry. It says, debt of £24,000, sub-postmaster blaming Horizon, uh, live sub-postmaster and therefore internal processes need to be exhausted, uh, push through normal processes to see if a Horizon issue identified. Uh, maybe some challenges around sub-postmaster refusing to follow standard process, i.e. want solicitor to attend meetings, etc. Uh, this is to be managed in the usual way. Uh, was this typical of the kinds of things that were discussed in those meetings? So issues where uh, sub-postmasters had blamed the Horizon system for losses? My understanding of these conference calls was that it was supposed to raise across the business all the Horizon issues so that people were aware. Do you recall this particular issue at all? No. no. Thank you. That can come down. Um, so, just by way of an overview, consolidating all of those documents that we've just been looking at, um, you started working on post offices cases in February or March 2012. Yes. Um, by March, there was liaison with Fujitsu about the Bramwell case. Yes. 
April, May, there were references to reports on horizon integrity that we saw. Yes. Um, we've seen in June 2012 the horizon integrity report that circulated by Rachel Panter um, yes. and a body of horizon cases that are being dealt with by your team. Yes. Um, in July, we have the advice from Mr. Bowyer, uh, and we then have, by 2013, those regular calls that you occasionally attended. Yes. Um, was concern about the Horizon system, in effect, a constant from the beginning of your time at Cartwright King to the end of your time? The end of my time in that department? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to a different topic, uh, and that Mr. is... Mr. Blake, before you do that, um, uh, and I may have, may have missed it, so I apologise if I um, am asking for information about something that's already been given. But do we know, and when I use the word we, I mean the inquiry, so ha have any documents, for example, been received? which show who commissioned Mr. Boyer's um, advice in July 2012. It's in the context of the Wiley case. I appreciate that. Yes. But we actually know why, why he was asked to write it. I, I think my answer to you will be, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you on that one. <laughs> fine. That, no, that's fine. It was just, I was interesting to see, uh, interesting to know, if possible, why an in-house counsel had been asked to write in the terms that he ended up writing in, so to speak. Uh, Mr. Bolsey, are you able to assist us at all? I, I, I'm afraid I can't, no. Yeah, okay, fine. Moving on to the role of an expert, uh, and we'll see how it plays out in various case studies in due course, but can we begin by looking at poll 00020489, um, we are now in September 2012, so after the advice had been written by Mr. Bowyer. Could we start on the second page, please? Thank you. Um, there's an email from Jarnel Singh to Andy Cash and yourself. And it says, Andy slash Andrew, please see Helen Rowe's disclosures final draft report on her analysis of Horizon cases. I look forward to receiving your comments before forwarding the data for an expert report. Um, we know and we've seen advice from Helen Rose, or a report that was written by Helen Rose a year later, June 2013. It's a separate piece of work. Yes. Do, do you recall this piece of work at all? I think I've seen it when reviewing the documents that were sent to me, yes, or, or reference to it. Um, do, do you recall your involvement or receiving it at the time? Um, not specifically, no. Could we turn to the first page, please, and we'll start at the bottom. Um, Andy Cash to Jarnell Singh. Uh, Jarnell Harry, I think that's Harry Bowyer advises that the report, provided it is comprehensive, is what is needed, uh, and we now need the expert's report on it as soon as practicable um, in view of the current case's timetables. And if we scroll up, we have a response from Jarnal Singh, you're copied in. Um, he says, Andy, thinking about the choice of expert in this case, I have in the past instructed Gareth Jenkins of Fujitsu in the case of Misra, at which, incidental, was the only challenge on Horizon, he provided expertise in dealing with defense's boundless inquiry into the whole Horizon system. Uh, perhaps we need to reconsider whether to instruct him, as he may be viewed too close to the system, uh, but instruct somebody entirely independent, question mark. Your thoughts, please, and also whether you or Harry have anybody in mind. And if we scroll up, we have the a response from Harry Bowyer, and he says, um, I would have preferred somebody entirely independent, but this is such specialist, a, a specialist area 
that we would be hard pushed to get a report in the time scale that we require. We might open our expert up to allegations of partiality, but his expertise will be unlikely to be challenged. Were you aware of the discussion about the identity of the post office's expert witness? The identity of the expert, sorry. Yes. So these, these discussions about whether to use Gareth Jenkins, was that something, um, you, you're certainly on this chain, um, you're not in the final email, but no. were you aware of discussions about, for example, Gareth Jenkins' uh, independence? Uh, I can't recall, but yes, I, I, it's clearly an issue because he worked for Fujitsu. Um, did you understand him to be an expert witness in the sense that he was subject to, for example, common law duties uh, and requirements of the criminal procedure rules? I certainly understood him to be an expert in his field. I didn't know if he'd been trained as an expert witness or had any training in that regard. Um, I think you've said in your witness statement, it's paragraph eight of your witness statement, you say, I understood that Jarnel Singh was ultimately responsible for instructing Gareth Jenkins. Um, what do you mean by that? In, in terms of giving instructions to him to do a piece of work, I prepare the report. Um, in terms of identification of his various obligation to the court and duties, whose responsibility did you see as that falling on? Mr. Singh's. In general terms, did you see the post office or Cartwright King as being responsible for the instruction of experts, ir irrespective of whether it's Mr. Jenkins or, or somebody else? Uh, again, I come back to <clears throat> my previous comments about these lines being very blurred. Yeah. Yes. Um, did you at that time have any concerns about Mr. Jenkins acting in that role? Well, clearly, he worked for Fujitsu, so that was a concern. Um, ultimately, that kind of thing does happen. Police investigations, police officers write reports on valuations in drug cases. They're deemed to be experts, but they're still part of the police, so it does happen. Um, do they write reports on cases that they have personal involvement in? Well, they, they will, yes, look at the the drugs and, and, and assess them regarding quality, weight, and, and the rest of it. So, <coughs> Was that something that you had previous involvement in, um, the instruction of an expert, prior to joining the post office team? So yes, um, we would instruct experts. The, the case management system we used would have a template letter setting out all the obligations that an, an expert would be obliged to, to consider. So is that, I mean, you don't have to give the name of a particular client, but you've mentioned you work for the RSPCA and other organizations. Generally, when you instructed an expert, would you use a standard template explaining the role yes. and duty of an expert? Yes, you would, yes. And did such a template exist in the case of post office prosecutions? I don't know. Not, not a separate template, I don't know. Did, did you ever see formal instructions to an expert? I did not. Did you ever question yourself as to why you didn't see any instructions to an expert? I, I didn't consider them to be, that, that part of it to be my responsibility. I accept when we actually got the report uh, from Mr. Jenkins, it, it didn't include those relevant paragraphs it should have done. And did you query that with anybody at the time? I did not know. Did anyone discuss that with you at the time? No. Uh, can we look at poll 00141416, please? Um, this is an email from Harry Bowyer to Jarnail Singh. You're not copied in, so I don't expect um, you necessarily to have read that at the time. Um, but I'd like to know whether you were aware either of its contents or in broad terms. Sure. Um, here he sets out what is expected from the expert. He says, hopefully Helen will confirm that the Horizon system 
has never been successfully challenged. Uh, I've yet to see any sign of any experts briefed on behalf of the defence. Uh, when she has completed her exercise, she should prepare a summary of these, those cases uh, where there's a proper uh, attack on the system rather than a gripe in the system that the system is at fault. Uh, although she should record those cases so that we can say they have been kept under review. They will become more numerous as the bandwagon picks up speed. Uh, just pausing there, bandwagon, w w was that a phrase that you were familiar with? Uh, I seem to recall it was a phrase used repeatedly, yes. Uh, repeatedly by who? Um, can't be specific, but certainly Mr Singh. I, I can't say who else. Um, then says, the expert will need to address the report uh, to the following issues. Number one, a description of the Horizon system. Uh, two, a declaration that it has yet to be attacked successfully. Three, a summary of the basic attacks made on the system, concentrating on any expert reports served in past cases. If there are none, then state that no expert has yet been found by any defence team or civil or criminal to attack the system. At the moment, there seems to be little more than griping by defendants that the system must be at fault without saying how. Uh, plainly, like all accounting systems, there is room for human error, uh, keying in wrong amounts, etc. But the expert should be able to state that innocent human error is unlikely to produce the types of discrepancies of many thousands of pounds over many months. He then says a decent report along those lines will go a long way to putting this issue to bed. Were you aware that that was going to be forming the basis of a statement? No. Um, looking at it now, how appropriate do you consider uh, those issues and the way they're put to be? Sorry, it's a bit difficult to take it all in. Uh, which, which, which are you... In... For example, there seems to be a focus on... Um, litigation and how it has yet to be attacked successfully uh, rather than um, for example asking the expert to comment in detail about the existence of bugs errors or defects in the system uh, do you consider those topics that the expert would need to address to be the right topics appropriate topics um, sorry it's a bit difficult to, for me to say on on the spot like that I would have thought um, concentrating on, on, on the system itself would have been more appropriate. Were you involved in any discussions about what the expert might put in the report? No. Can we look at poll 00096997, please? And could we start on the second page? Um, Mr. Jenkins produces a report, uh, and it's then sent in the middle email from Martin Smith um, to William Martin, Harry Bowyer, Andy Cash, Rachel Panter. Who was William Martin? I don't know. No. He's, I, he didn't work for Carl Rat King, as far as I know. Let's, let's scroll up, and that will hopefully assist us. Um, so you're not on that email distribution list, but if we look at that email at the top of this page from Harry Bowyer to Martin Smith, copied to Andy Cash. Um, he says as follows, Martin, um, at first sight, these, this, these look like a good base upon which our reports can be based. As most are fishing expeditions, they will do in their current form. Um, scrolling, or, sorry, down that email, he says, um, if there is a specific challenge in, ca um, in case then the statement and the report can be tweaked to cover the eventuality. My view is that most challenges to the Horizon system should now vanish away before the trial. Uh, were you aware of the production of a statement that could be tweaked to cover various different eventualities? Um, ultimately, yes, because the, the statement he produced... Um, he was then provided with the case summaries and defence statements and asked to address those issues. 
statement. So were you aware that it was a generic statement that would then be tweaked as appropriate to the particular case? That's how it panned out, yes. Are you able to assist us with who at Cartwright King had carriage of the statement, uh, if anybody? So who, who it was that, for example, put it in statement form rather than in um, the form that it may have been no, sent No, I thought that had been done by Mr. Jenkins rather than Cartwright King. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to come back to the generic statements uh, in the context of those specific case studies that we're going to get to after the break. Hmm. Um, but just one last document before the break uh, on the topic of expert evidence, and that is poll 00323641. We're moving back to the Bramwell case. We're now in um, May 2012 in the Bramwell case. Uh, and it is uh, an email from yourself to Steve Bradshaw. Steve Bradshaw was, I think, the investigator in that case. Is that right? I believe so, yes. Um, it's that substantive paragraph that I would like to ask you about, the bottom one, and it says, with regard to your statement, which is in effect being treated as an expert's report about the Horizon system, the judge has directed that you are to liaise with Mr. Jenner, the author of the defense report, <coughs> in the usual way between experts to identify the issues of disagreement between you. Uh, this could be done by telephone, etc. Uh, the purpose would be to identify prior to trial what can be agreed and what is disputed about the Horizon system, narrowing down the issues and making evidence uh, quick and relevant. Um, it, it seems there as though the suggestion is that his witness statement is being treated in effect as an expert report. Um, would it be possible for the person who is in fact investigating um, an offence to write a report uh, and for it to have the status of an expert report? No. So. Uh, I think when he actually served his statement, he, he made it clear that he wasn't an expert, but a lay witness talking about the system. Um, in this email, I'm obviously referring to the fact that he's being asked to, to discuss what he says with the, the defense expert in, in a way that would have been done by an independent expert witness. Um, we, we've spoken already about a blurring occurring in terms of who had responsibility for instructing the expert and the instructions that were provided to the expert. Was a particular witness's status also something that there was some degree of blurring? Yes, I'd agree with that. Um, and why do you think that was? I'm not sure. Um, uh, uh, the system was obviously quite a unique one, so the only people who really understood it were the people who were involved in it on, on a daily basis, either because they were developing it or were using it or investigating it. Do you recall communications with experts being, for example, recorded in uh, the disclosure schedule? No. Um, and I think you say you, you hadn't, in fact, seen any formal instructions to an expert at all. No. Um, do you recall any conversations that you had with Mr. Jenkins um, or others within your team about the duties of an expert? No. Um, thank you, sir. That might be an appropriate moment to take a mid-morning break um, before we move on to the case studies. Yes, certainly. <clears throat> what time shall we resume? If we come back at 20 past 11, please. Yeah, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, moving on to the case study of Angela Sefton and Anne Neild. Yes. Um, 
I want to begin just by taking you to the Court of Appeal judgment in Allen and Others, which is the case um, that uh, contains their appeal. Can we look at poll 00113343? Thank you very much. Um, and it's paragraph 23. It should be, I think, at page 6. The inquiry has looked at this before, so I'll only very briefly take you through some brief facts of this case. Um, it says there at paragraph 23 that Angela Sefton and Anne Neild each pleaded guilty to one count of false accounting uh, with which they were jointly charged. The allegation against them was in short that between the 1st of January 2006 and the 6th of January 2012, they had falsified gyro deposit entries on Horizon in relation to the receipt of £34,000 in donations made to the charity Animals in Need. Um, thank you very much. If we could scroll down to the bottom of that page, at paragraph 28, we see it says there uh, that on the 20th of January 2012, Ms. Sefton and Ms. Neild were each interviewed. Uh, Ms. Sefton said that they only ever delayed payments and had never withheld them. Animals in Need had been significantly affected because the charity had continued to use gyro deposit slips, which needed a date stamp rather than as in nearly all other cases, moving to a swipe card or barcode system. Uh, she and Ms. Neild uh, did not report the losses because they were too terrified. It appears that Ms. Neild gave a broadly similar or at least consistent account. She said she did not know where the shortages were coming from. Um, scrolling down, it says at 29, both Ms. Sefton and Ms. Neild submitted defense statements which questioned whether the losses were genuine or horizon generated. Next paragraph, paragraph 30, um, Ms. Neild repeated the disclosure request uh, with the result that the post office agreed that a defense expert should be allowed to attend the branch to analyze the data. The post office served a witness statement by Gareth Jenkins in which he maintained that there was no problem with Horizon. Um, its call logs show that some difficulties with Horizon had been sporadically reported uh, to the post office between 2005 and 2011. Other records show numerous difficulties with Horizon in 2009. It says at paragraph 32, the post office accepts that this was an unexplained shortfall case uh, and that evidence from Horizon was essential to the prosecution of both Ms. Sefton and Ms. Neild. The post office failed to carry out a proper investigation into Horizon issues and failed to disclose full call logs and other records indicating that there had been problems with Horizon at the branch. In addition, Mr. Jenkins had informed the post office's solicitors that he had no information regarding complaints or investigations into Horizon, and it has already been established that it's not possible to examine the original Horizon system <clears throat> that was operational until 2010. Um, similarly, I have not been presented with any audit data relating to any of these cases to examine. Uh, these defects in Mr. Jenkins' evidence were not disclosed, uh, nor were two earlier relevant reports disclosed. Uh, and the Court of Appeal concludes in the paragraph below, in those circumstances, the Post Office concludes that the prosecution of Ms. Sefton and Ms. Neild was unfair and an affront to justice. Uh, and they conclude that the convictions were unsafe. Now, if I could take you to your witness statement. <clears throat> now, it's WITN 09670100. Um, paragraph 11, that's page 6. Um, you introduce the cases of Sefton and Neild on page 6, paragraph 11. And you say that you received a green jacket file between the 3rd of February and the 1st of March of 2012. And at the bottom of that page, you say, uh, the file contained no separate instructions to me, either identifying my specific role or anything else. I believed I was acting as an agent for post office in the prosecution. I was not supplied by way of introduction with any policy documents in relation to the conduct of prosecutions by the post office, uh, disclosure, or anything else. I was not supplied with any information in relation to the Horizon system, the details of any data it generated, issues relating to its reliability, any relevant cases or details regarding any civil actions or otherwise. Um, having worked on 
other private prosecutions, not post office prosecutions. Um, did you consider that to be unusual? So th this case was the first private prosecution I dealt with. Um, were you expecting to receive the information that you've listed there? I was expecting to receive some kind of briefing, yes. Did you see your role in this case as advising on, for example, which lines of inquiry the post office should pursue? Well, the, the letter that was addressed from the business uh, unit asked for uh, uh, an analysis of the sufficiency of evidence. Um, I don't recall it saying any more than that. Um, did you see your role as being involved in any way in, in the investigation strategy, for example? Well, um, I mean, the, the investigation part of it should be left to the investigator to some extent, but yes, um, I would imagine a prosecutor w would assist with that if he felt appropriate. And how about meeting the post office's disclosure obligations? Did you see your role as being involved in helping it meet its disclosure obligations? Ultimately, yes. Um, having received inadequate uh, amount of information, did you, did you say, where's my letter of instruction? Uh, where are the policy documents? Please provide me with sufficient information. No, I just tried to get on with it. Uh, looking back, was that the right or the wrong thing to do? That was unwise. Um, can we look at poll 0004013? This is the letter I think you were just talking about, the 2nd of February 2012. Um, it's a letter from Maureen Moores in the fraud team or security team. Um, she says there, uh, it's addressed to the Royal Mail Group criminal law team. Um, the outcome of inquiries in this case are reported by Steve Bradshaw, fraud advisor at pages 2 to 14, together with a taped interview summary. Um, it is the business unit recommendation that prosecution should be pursued, provided the evidence is sufficient to do so. Uh, would you therefore please advise on the sufficiency of evidence in this matter? Um, you've said in your witness statement that this immediately struck you. Um, why did it immediately strike you? Um, because there was some sense here that uh, the interests of the business uh, were involved in the decision to prosecute. Um, was this a letter that was sent to you or received by you on top of your green file or...? It was just contained within the file. I came across it because it was probably on top of the, in, the documents inside. And the request, would you therefore please advise on the sufficiency of evidence in this matter? Did you understand that to be an instruction to you or to somebody else? Well, it was addressed to the Royal Mail Group criminal law team, but I understood that this, this was now my job. So yes, this is the sum total of my instructions. Um, the fact that the business unit had recommended that prosecution should be pursued, you said that struck you. Did you raise that with anybody? I, I did uh, ask about this. Um, I th think the explanation I was given uh, related to their service requirements for having a, a post office within a certain geographical distance or, or of a population source or something like that. So, for example, if, if something a riot gone on at a an isolated Scottish island where there was only one sub-postmaster available and hard to replace, uh, then might be, the post office might be less inclined to prosecute them as opposed to uh, an inner city environment where a replacement would be easily obtainable. Uh, who told you that? I, I can't recall. Um, so somebody told you that whether or not a post office was um, busy or whether a postmaster was replaceable or not fed into the prosecution decision? I, I believe so, yes. And did that strike you as concerning at all? Yeah, I was surprised, yes. Um, did you raise it with anybody? 
Um, I can't recall. You've said that Mr. Singh considered the public interest test was always met uh, whenever there were losses to the public purse that were over a certain threshold. Um, is that correct? Yes. Um, was that something that you agreed with? No, I thought the test was wider. And did you question it? No. The letter asks whether the evidence is sufficient, um, and I think your statement, you, you've said that you weren't sure whether the test uh, was one uh, of a realistic prospect of conviction or, or something else. It wasn't clear to you, is that correct? Yes. Um, did you, at the time, consider that this was uh, not sufficient to properly instruct you? could say that, yes. And did you raise that with anybody? No, I just did the best I could uh, and adopted the, the, the code. Can we please look at your advice? That's poll 00057495. This is dated the 1st of March, 2012. First paragraph, you say, in my opinion, the evidence is sufficient to afford a realistic prospect of conviction in respect of the draft charges attached. In light of their admissions and interview, the prospects of success are good. Uh, you then say, in view of the nature of the charges, the amount involved, which has not been repaid, and the breaches of trust aspect, this is not a case suitable for a caution. Um, prior to taking up your post um, involved with prosecuting post office cases, um, had you ever been involved in giving people cautions or the, the provision of cautions? No. Um, as I said, this was the first case I was involved in where I'd been asked to provide charging evidence or advice, sorry. Had you ever received training in the principles underlying the issuing of a caution? Well, I was aware of them from a defence uh, perspective, yes. But Had anybody in Cartwright King talked to you about the matters that you would take into account in order to issue a caution? No. Um, what did you understand to be the power of the, pro the post office to issue a caution. I'm not sure that I consider that. If we look at the various <coughs> advices that you gave in post office cases, will we ever see you having recommended a caution? I don't believe so, no. The fourth paragraph says as follows, uh, whilst there remains a suspicion that both Sefton and Neild were involved in theft of the losses concerned, uh, given their prolonged attempt to cover these up, they could blame each other, making individual responsibility difficult, if not impossible, to ascertain. And at present, there's insufficient evidence surrounding the handling of cash at the branch to rule out the possibility of a third party being responsible. On the other hand, uh, they have made clear admissions to false accounting, admitting intent to cause loss, even if only for a temporary period. The prospect of them ever making good the losses, of course, dwindled um, as the losses increased. If a third party might be responsible, um, how did you have sufficient information to consider that they had been dishonest? The dishonesty arose from the method of the false accounting in the sense that they were suppressing the gyro checks. So that's what I was considering. Um, did you take into account, for example, the admissions that they made in interview? Did that have any effect on your assessment of whether dishonesty was involved in this particular case? Yes. You did take that into account? I did. And is that set out in this advice? No, it's not. We'll get to the issue of call logs, but might the fact that, for example, they called a helpline be relevant to an issue of dishonesty? Potentially, yes. yes. 
Uh, and is there any assessment of that issue? Not this in this advice, no. Do you think that this advice in itself is, is, is a sufficient advice, or do you think it's too brief? It's far too brief. As I said, it was the first one that uh, I dealt with, I believe, um, and I tried to improve them subsequently. Were you copying a format from colleagues? Was this something you've been I told to I think I copied uh, a format from either the Bramwell case or, or another one that I'd seen with the initial files that had been sent to me. Uh, were you provided with any training from anybody at Cartwright King as to uh, what to do on receipt of instructions from the post office? No. Is it effectively a baptism of fire on joining that team? Yes. Did you voice any concerns about that at the time? No. Um, on reflection, do you th what, why do you think that was? I think I, they just assumed I should get on with it. Were you overloaded with work? Were you insufficiently supervised? Were you, uh, was there some other reason why the level of work is not up to the standard that you would expect? Just lack of experience. Can we please look at poll 00057496? Uh, these are the proposed charges. Was that something that you drafted? Uh, I believe so. Can we please turn now to poll 00166331, please? And it's an email from yourself to Steve Bradshaw, the investigator, on the 3rd of July 2012. Thank you. Um, you say there, Andrea mentioned at the hearing that both solicitors indicated that they were intending to plead not guilty to the charges despite their apparent admissions. Um, I don't think that this case, uh, this could have anything to do with the independent Horizon Review as this case relates to simple check suppression as opposed to any audit trail, etc. Now the independent Horizon Review, is that what we know is the second site investigation. It must be, yes. yes. Um, so you're there giving thought to whether the second site um, investigation might be relevant to the issues in this particular case? That's correct. Uh, and at that stage, concluding that they weren't? Yes. Uh, the, 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 the gyro credits were kept in a drawer, so I assume that was outside of the system. The comments that they made in an interview, did they not influence your decision at all? Uh, they ought to have done. I couldn't see past the, the offence of false accounting that I've seen. But you say that they ought to have done? In, in, with hindsight, yes. Um, you say there, however, in light of this indication, it may be prudent to fill any potential gaps in our case at this time and to that end, a statement from animals in need would be useful, um, etc. I now want to move on to the defence statement. That is poll 00058300, uh, and it's page 5. Um, this is the defence statement um, from Miss Neild. And it says as follows at the bottom of the page. It says, the defendant accepts that losses were shown on the Horizon computer system from 2005. The defendant does not know how the losses were incurred. The defendant now believes that such losses may have, been, may have shown as a result of the failures of the Horizon computer system. Um, if we scroll down to C, about halfway down that paragraph, it says, um, this was not done with a dishonest intent. Um, or with any intention to make gain or cause the complainant any loss. Rather, it was a desperate attempt to make good the apparent losses on the system. At no stage were animals in need ever deprived of the money, etc. Um, we have a response from you 
Um, there, there are certain disclosure requests at the bottom, so that's page seven. I think it's over the page. Three disclosure requests, uh, any material that points towards other suspects, uh, B, details of any bad character of any prosecution witness, and then C, uh, details of complaints and investigations into the Horizon computer system. So uh, within their defense, her defense statement, uh, she has requested details of complaints and investigations into the Horizon system. Uh, we then have your response over the page, please. The 28th of August, uh, and this is a response to her solicitors. And you say as follows. Um, on the basis of the defence statement that you have provided, I have not identified any further prosecution material which is disclosable to you in accordance with the uh, CPIA. Specifically, in relation to the points raised in your statement, number one, there were no known other suspects in the case uh, and no material relating to the same. Uh, two, which was details of bad character, um, you say none known. And then three, which was the request for details of complaints and investigations into the Horizon computer system, uh, you say as follows. Uh, your client is charged with false accounting by failing to make entries onto the Horizon system regarding the deposit slips found, and thus the offence has occurred outside of the system. Material relating to the Horizon system is therefore not deemed disclosable at this time. Do you accept now that what was going on in the system was relevant to the issue of dishonesty? Yes. Um, the phrase outside of the system, was that a phrase that you had heard used by others or was that your own phrase? Uh, I'm not sure. Possibly my own. Uh, I can't. Uh, do you recall this decision, the decision not to disclose information um, relating to the Horizon system? Was that your decision or was that somebody else's decision? Uh, I, I'm not sure. <coughs> and why is it that you're not sure? I can't remember if I discussed that with anyone beforehand or not. Um, as the solicitor with carriage of the case corresponding with the solicitors for the defendant in criminal prosecutions, uh, do you see yourself as responsible for the decision? Yes. Yes. Um, when you say you're not sure who made the decision, uh, was that, again, a blurring of the lines or, or something else? Potentially, yes. Um, were there cases that you recall where the disclosure decisions that you passed on to um, defence solicitors was a decision that had been made by somebody else? Yes, absolutely. Um, in respect of material relating to the Horizon system, did you ever question the responses that had been provided? Well, they, they were provided by our client, essentially. So, um, no. I mean, we've seen the Harry Bowyer advice, for example. We're, we're here in um, the, I think it was August 2012. Um, do you think at that time you should have thought more about the disclosability of material relating to the Horizon system. Yes. Um, can we go to poll 0004 4036? Um, this is the defence statement in relation to the co-accused, Ms Sefton. Again, paragraph 5 of her defence statement, she says, uh, the defendant asserts that significant shortages slash losses had been a common experience in the past, uh, losses started to occur from 2005. The defendant had to make good a great deal of those losses out of her own pocket. Um, but as the losses increased, the defendant could not afford to pay, uh, to repay them from her own resources. If we go over the page, please. Um, paragraph 11, it says, the defendant also prays in aid in her defense the fact that the post office computer system known as Horizon, installed sometime in 2005, has been the subject of criticism in the press. A firm of solicitors in the Midlands, Shoesmiths, is acting on behalf of over 100 sub-postmasters who in the past have wrongly been accused of fraud and false accounting and have been compelled by the post office to repay us significant sums of money or face criminal prosecution, <coughs> presumably. 
At the heart of their complaints is the fact that the Horizon computer system is to blame uh, for these apparent losses due to some form of technical malfunction. Uh, and her request at the bottom, uh, she requests details at number three, details of any complaints made to the post office regarding the operation of the Horizon computer system from 2005 onwards and details of the steps taken to deal with those complaints. And over the page, there's also a request in relation to correspondence with members of parliament, or from members of parliament. Um, can we please bring up onto screen poll 00166335, please? And if it's possible, can I have alongside this document on screen, um, poll 00044036, uh, page two. Um, so this is the defence statement that we just looked at, and we have those three requests at the bottom there. Uh, and you are contacting Steve Bradshaw, the investigator, and you say, Dear Steve, please find enclosed defence case statement served on behalf of Angela Sefton. Uh, please can you see if there is any material to disclose on points one and two raised on page two. So we see there one is all notes, statements and other materials concerning any other suspect. Uh, and two, all such notes, statements, and other materials relating to any other witness, etc. Um, and then you say in your, doc, in your email on the left-hand side, John Gibson has been advised um, of the development so far as the second site review is concerned. Now, it, it doesn't look there as though you've tasked Mr. Bradshaw with looking into uh, the request three, that is details of any complaints made regarding the operation of the Horizon system. Mm. Uh, can you assist us with why um, he wasn't tasked with, with that? Is it because there was a separate <coughs> disclosure officer tasked with those specific areas? That, that's what we'd like to know. I mean, yes. John Gibson, who was he? That was the prosecuting counsel in the case. Um, so he has been advised of the development so far as Second Sight is concerned. Is that... You? you providing Mr. Gibson with advice? I'm not sure. I can't remember who. Um, uh, and when you refer to a second uh, person looking into issues, uh, are you talking about Helen Rose there? Or yes, I believe so, yes. Uh, and did you see Helen Rose as uh, responsible for compliance with uh, the disclosure requirements under I, the criminal... I procedure? seem to remember seeing uh, an email from John L. Singh appointing her as a disclosure officer to do with the previous Horizon complaints. I'd like now to look at a specific application for disclosure that was made in this case. Um, can we look back at poll 00058300? Uh, Ms. Neild makes an application for specific disclosure. Thank you very much. That's the 13th of September 2012. Um, can we please look at page two? This is the application. It, it says there at paragraph four, the defendant has sought and has been refused uh, disclosure of the following. So th this is what um, was sought by Ms. Neild and what was not provided. Uh, details of complaints and investigations into the Horizon computer system. Uh, access to the Horizon computer system used by the defendant. Um, so if there had been a separate disclosure officer, it appears that certainly by this stage there had been no, in fact, no disclosure of details of complaints and investigations into the Horizon computer system. Would you agree with that? Yes. Um, could we scroll over the page, please? Paragraph 8 says as follows, it says, The defence are aware from articles in the press and communications from the House of Commons that the Horizon system has been the subject of much controversy over the past few years 
and that a significant number of sub-postmasters allege that the Horizon system published incorrect losses on the system. Uh, further, that they have in many cases been wrongly convicted of false accounting. Uh, the issue is serious enough to have warranted the involvement of a Member of Parliament, etc. Um, if we scroll down to paragraph 9, please. It says, the defence are therefore confident that the prosecution have in their possession or easily accessible to them records of complaints and investigations into the Horizon system. Uh, and then the application gives the reasons for the application. Um, first is that it goes to the issue of dishonesty. Uh, at paragraph 12, it says, when the jury consider whether the attribution of monies in this way by the defendant was dishonest, it is a relevant consideration whether or not the losses were real and whether they were attributable to her. If the losses were the result of a computer error, then the jury may well take a very different view of the defendant's mental state uh, than they would if she had taken the money. Uh, and it also, they says, goes to the issue of intent to gain or cause loss. Uh, the second relevant issue is the question of the defendant's intention, whether she intended to make a gain for herself or cause a loss to another. Uh, and then further down, they make submissions Paragraph 15 says, it is submitted uh, that material which suggests that the Horizon system has accounting faults is therefore relevant to and of potential assistance to the defence for the reasons outlined at paragraphs 12 to 14 above. Um, I'd like to look at the response to this. Can we please look at poll 0005830 um, If we could go to page two, bottom of page two. Uh, thank you. So we have an email there from yourself, the 14th of September, to Andy Cash. And you say, following discussion with Harry, so that it seems is Harry Bowyer, is that right? Yes, correct. Um, 14th of September 2012, so we're now two months after Mr. Bowyer's advice um, that we saw this morning. Um, please see draft email to outside counsel in this case. And then if we look below, we have the draft email. Um, Dear sir, please place the attached Section 8 application together with the brief already held by Counsel John Gibson. Um, so that's the disclosure application that we've just seen. Is that correct? Yes. Um, counsel is invited to contact instructing solicitors to discuss the prosecution response and should be aware of the following. Uh, number one, Post Office Limited have appointed one of their investigators, Helen Rose, as disclosure officer dealing with horizon challenges. That's exactly as you said a moment ago. Um, she has prepared a document slash spreadsheet detailing all such cases, past and present, approximately 20 in total, uh, although none thus far successfully argued in court. It is felt uh, by in-house counsel um, that this currently uh, a working document and currently undisclosable as it contains some personal opinion. Um, now, pausing there, in-house counsel, is that Harry Bowyer or is that somebody else? It must be him. Um, so it's not to be disclosed because it contains, it's a working document and contains some personal opinion. Um, do you think that that's a fair assessment? Uh, of what it says, yes. Um, do you think that the fact that something is a working document or contained opinion uh, is relevant to whether it should be disclosed or not? I can't, I can't remember the content of, of what her report said. How about the detail, some of the detail that was contained, that there were 20 cases uh, and perhaps some of the detail of those 20 cases? I mean, did you, for example, for yourself, look at the document that had been um, compiled uh, and assess for yourself whether the information contained within it was disclosable? I can't, I can't recall if I did or not. Do you think you did or didn't? I'm, I can't recall. Um, would you agree that that document that is referred to, or drafts of it, would be disclosable, irrespective of whether it contains personal opinion or not? Um, I, 
Without looking at it, I can't say. I, I, I don't know the extent of her personal opinion. Well, it is personal it's opinion, a bar to disclosure of a document about 20 Horizon cases. Are you able to answer that without seeing the content of that document? Repeat the question, sorry. Are you able to say whether a document about the Horizon system, about 20 cases, um, should not be disclosed because it contains some personal opinion? H how is the fact that it contains personal opinion relevant or not to whether it should be disclosed? Um, surely that must depend on what the personal opinion was. Can you give me an example of where personal opinion might make something not disclosable? Uh, where the personal opinion wasn't, wasn't appropriate or supported by evidence, for example? I'd so if something isn't appropriate or isn't supported by evidence, it shouldn't be disclosed? Depending on, on, on what that is, yes. I, I, uh, where do you get that from? Is that from a, a rule, a procedure, Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act? Or where, where do I see something that might make that as a rule for disclosure? Um, with, without seeing the document, I can't say. Um, number two, in addition to the second site review, the post office have been advised to obtain and are in the process of doing so an expert's report from Fujitsu UK, the Horizon system developers, confirming the system is robust. Um, is that what we will come to see the uh, statement of Gareth Jenkins. Yes. yes. Um, do you think it is appropriate to um, tell prosecuting counsel that you are obtaining a statement that uh, from Fujitsu that confirms the system is robust? Um, with hindsight, I can see what you're saying. Um, it should be the other way around. It should be looking at whether the system uh, works properly. Number three, poll, the post office maintain the system is robust, but in light of adverse publicity, the view of in-house counsel is that defense should be given an opportunity to test system should they still wish to do so on consideration of our report. If we scroll up on the page before, we can see that you've sent the email to John L. Singh at the post office. And you say, please see below draft email I'm proposing to send out to council. Um, Andy Cash has asked me to seek specific instruction from the post office on two issues. Uh, one, would we allow a defense expert direct access to the Horizon system? And two, is a six-week timetable realistic for Fujitsu to prepare the report proposed? Um, can you uh, assist us with... Um, what level of involvement John L. Singh had in, in this matter and why it is that you are contacting him? Um, because he, in my mind, was responsible for commissioning the report from Fujitsu in the first place. Uh, and he would be able to clarify the, um, the post office's stance on this access to the system by a defence expert. Can we scroll up to the first page, the bottom of the first page, please? We have a response from Jarnal Singh. He says, um, one, as you may be aware, in the past, defense expert has attended the relevant sub post office and has been able uh, to analysis the relevant data, etc. However, this request is very vague and general. Are you able to clarify specifics? Um, two, Gareth Jenkins has previously provided a report in the past <coughs> He's presently on holiday for two weeks. Are you able to wait for his return? Um, and the email before that, please. Um, you say, you're right. I'll explain that defense experts have attended sub-post offices in the past to analyze data, but access to the system beyond that would need to be clearly specified and approved by the post office before being allowed. Um, are, are you able to assist us with what you meant by clearly specified, what level of detail um, they would have to... Have I think to it was just in response to him saying that the request was vague and needed clarifying. Would the post office ever, in your experience, provide assistance 
uh, to a defendant in criminal proceedings as to what it is that they may need to show or may need to be looking at in the Horizon system? Uh, I wasn't aware uh, of instances where defence experts had been to the post office before. Sorry. I'm going to now look at your letter to um, Ms. Neal's solicitors. Can we look at poll 00058306, please? We're now on the 18th of September. Uh, and this is the information that you are providing to them pursuant to their application for disclosure. Uh, you say as follows. Over the years, some post offices under investigation for losses have claimed that the Horizon system is at fault. A number of these cases have made their way through the courts, but to date, none have been successful. Uh, notwithstanding this, a review of the number of cases is due to take place, and details of this are attached. And we'll come to see that attachment. Um, B. In addition to this review, it's understood that a further report from Fujitsu UK, the Horizon System developers, confirming the integrity of the system uh, is being prepared. At present, the working assumption is that it will take six weeks to prepare, but the time scale may change. Uh, defence experts have in the past attended the relevant post offices to be able to analyse the relevant data. Access to the system beyond that would need to be specified and approved by the post office before being allowed. Um, and, and over the page, we have the level of detail that is provided in respect of um, the challenges through the courts. It's, it's, sorry, it's over the page again. Thank you. This is the detail that's provided, and I'm just going to read that. It says, um, after a number of meetings between post office management and members of parliament in relation to the court cases, it was agreed that the post office would undertake an external review of the cases uh, which had been raised by members' constituents. As the post office continues to have absolute confidence in the robustness and integrity of its horizon system and its branch accounting processes, it has no hesitation in agreeing to an external review of these few individual cases. Um, so is this, this is the, referring to the second site review, isn't it? Yes. Um, so it, refer, it says there are a few individual cases. Were you aware of the second site review involving a few individual cases? Um. I thought there was more. Yes. Yes. Um, in order to provide assurance to the interested parties, it was proposed that the review be undertaken by independent auditors second sight. Uh, the review will specifically be specifically restricted to the cases raised by the MPs, as well as reviewing the accounting uh, procedures, processes, and reconciliations undertaken in relation to the cases in question. Um, Etc. And, and in the final paragraph, it says, All the above is accepted based on the terms of the review being carried out, uh, but this is in no way acknowledge, acknowledgement by the post office that there is an issue with Horizon. Over the past 10 years, many millions of branch reconciliations have been carried out with transactions and balances accurately recorded by more than 25,000 different sub-postmasters, and the Horizon system continues to work properly in post offices across the length and breadth of the UK. When the system has been challenged in criminal courts, it has been successfully defended. Um, are, are you aware of who drafted this document? Um, so from the email chains I think I've seen, this was considered uh, the considered response of the post office. Um, and was drafted in conjunction with John L. Singh and others above him in the hierarchy. Um, four days earlier, we have the email that we've seen, a discussion about a spreadsheet with 20 cases challenging Horizon. Um, am I right in saying this is all they're getting in response to their disclosure request? That's correct, yes. Um, what is your view as to the adequacy of that it's response? It's not adequate. How is it that an inadequate response was sent to um, these defendants? It, it was the, the response that the post office had scripted uh, and had asked to be sent to them. Um, do you take any personal responsibility insofar as that disclosure is concerned? 
well, I should have challenged it, but it was the client's response, so we forwarded it on. Did you yourself look at those 20 cases that were on that list to see if there was any overlapping uh, information that might be disclosable? I can't recall. You can't recall? I can't recall that, no. But would you recall having taken that kind of a step in these proceedings? Thank you, pardon, what kind of step? If you had seen a list of 20 cases involving challenges to Horizon, would that be something that was memorable or was that something that is forgettable? Um, I don't know. Can we look at poll 00097138, please? Can we please start at the second page? And it's an email from Rachel Panter to Gareth Jenkins. Um, were you working closely with Rachel Panter in relation to the case? I mean, two of your cases at least are mentioned. Yes, three, there. three cases, in fact, that we know that you had involvement in Ishak, Sefton, and Neil and Alan. I Ishak would have been Martin Smith's case, but yes, I was aware of it. Um, were you closely I involved with? the work that Rachel Panther was doing in relation to those cases in which you had conduct? Well, she insisted in, in obtaining the report in that respect, yes. Did you say she, she insisted in? Uh, assisted. 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 Um, she says in the email to Gareth Jenkins, um, as you may already be aware, your expert report dealing, uh, detailing the reliability of the Horizon system has been served as evidence in a number of post office cases that are at various stages of the court processes, process, uh, most of which are listed for trial in the early part of next year. Um, she says, as we um, already have your detailed report, I would like to serve it in each case listed below. All of the following cases have raised issues with the reliability of the Horizon system. And we have there the case study that we're currently talking about, Sefton and Neild. Um, the final paragraph there, she says, I would like to stress that I do not anticipate that all of the above cases will reach trial stage. Uh, please could you read the case summaries attached and send five original signed and dated copies of your report to me as soon as possible. Um, were you aware then that there was a request to Gareth Jenkins to tailor what was a effect generic report to uh, those six cases or to at least the cases that you were involved in amongst those six? That, that's what he did ultimately, so yes. Yes, and you were aware of that at the time? I became aware, certainly, yes. I mean, you, you had conduct of the case, presumably. Yes. You played a part in that decision making. <coughs> yes. Can we scroll up to page one, please? This is the response from Gareth Jenkins. He says, Rachel, can't you use the report I've already sent you? Uh, there's no mention of the case on the report. You should really be addressing such requests through Post Office Limited rather than directly to myself. As far as I know, there's no commercial cover in place for me to spend any time on such activities, and that includes, and uh, it gives the name of the case. Um, can you assist us? We, we spoke earlier about financial issues, cost of assistance. Mm. Uh, was that something that you recall at this particular time? Uh, yes, around this time, certainly. Uh, and what do you recall the issue being? Um, well, the issue of finance. Was it, for example, seen as um, a better use of finance to tailor a generic report than to commission individual reports on each occasion? I see. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if that was the purpose. Potentially, yes, I can see that now. Can we please look at FUJ00156677, please? And this is an email on the 30th of November from Rachel Panter. Uh, to Gareth Jenkins, you are copied in on this email. Um, and she says, hello, Gareth, hope you're well. Further to my previous email, please could you consider the attached and provide a signed and dated report which deals with individual, each individual case. 
Um, I would also like to update you on the developments on a couple of cases. Uh, if we, sorry, if we zoom out a little bit, you can see the attachments. So the attachments there are um, Dixon, Ishak, Sefton and Nielda, and one other case. Yes. So she is sending, as you say, case summaries and indictments in those cases to Gareth Jenkins and asking him to provide a signed and dated report which deals with each individual case. Is that correct? Yes. And to, and to comment on the, the, those enclosures. Uh, and she says further down this email, the remaining cases of Grant, Allen, Ishak, uh, Dixon, and Sefton and Neild all require a report, uh, with the most pressing one being Grant Allen. I'm hopeful that I can um, get a, a form from the court which will allow you to claim some of your expenses for attending to give evidence, although this is more commonly used when acting from a defence perspective, so I do not anticipate receiving a considerable sum. Um, do you, is it fair to say that there were no meaningful instructions provided to Mr Jenkins save what we can see here? Certainly no formal instructions. That's correct, yes. D did this at the time raise any issues for you? Uh, I'm not sure I was copied into this email, is that right? If we scroll out, I, I, I do think you were copied into Beg your pardon. Email, yes. Would you have yes, seen I'm this as a, as a standard email sent to I'm, Gareth Jenkins? I'm not sure if there'd been any instructions prior to this email. I wasn't sure at that point. But I think you've said you didn't see any instructions no, at all. I hadn't seen any. Was this typical of the kind of correspondence that would go between yourselves and Gareth Jenkins in respect of a request to produce a witness statement? Yes. Can we look at FUJ 00153865, please? This is an email to, from yourself to Rachel Panther and copied to Gareth Jenkins. Um, you say, Dear Rachel Gareth, please find enclosed outlines of the two cases which involve me. Uh, of the two, I would say that the Sefton and Neild case is the more urgent. And therefore, Gareth, I would be grateful if you could concentrate on that one first. Uh, it's listed for trial in January, etc. Um, again, was that a typical kind of correspondence from yourself to Gareth Jenkins requesting yes. a statement? Yes. Um, can we now move to poll 00089394, please? Thank you. We're now into December, the 5th of December. Uh, and I'd like to start on page two. If we look at page three on this chain, we have that email that we've just looked at. Uh, and then there's a response from Gareth Jenkins on page two. Um, he says as follows. He says, my understanding from Rachel uh, was that all that is required um, is a signed version of a standard report I produced a couple of months ago, attached together with two related documents. Uh, if that is the case, then I can get that produced, scanned and emailed to you in a couple of days. Uh, however, reading through the info you've given me, uh, perhaps you want me to cover some further things, uh, some observations. One, in the case of Neil and Sefton, uh, it is stated losses started in 2005, and this is linked to the installation of Horizon. Uh, my report shows that Horizon was rolled out between 1999 and 2002, so 2005 doesn't seem to tie in with Horizon being installed. Uh, NB, I have no records as to exactly when Horizon was installed in any branch, and I don't know if Post Office Limited have any such records. Uh, similarly, I have no idea if this mismatch uh, of dates is material. Uh, second, at some point in 2010, the post office would have been migrated from the original Horizon system to the new Horizon Online system. Uh, this is mentioned in the Grant Allen case, but not in the Neild and Sefton case. Um, he says at the end there, he says, note that I have no information regarding complaints or investigations into Horizon, and it has already been established that it's not possible to examine the original Horizon system that was operational until 2010. If we could scroll up, please. Uh, 
Um, at the bottom there, you have a response from yourself to Mr. Jenkins, uh, and you say, the only clarification I think I need at the moment relates to the timeline, uh, 2005 removal of cash account. Uh, could you clarify what this means and discount it as a possible explanation for the losses beginning to occur at the time in the Sefton and Neild case? Uh, the audit reports will simply show the money is missing, uh, so we'll take things, uh, so we'll not take things further. Uh, just pausing there, can you assist us? You say the audit reports will simply show the money missing, so we'll not take things further. Uh, wh why did you say that? Potentially for a couple of uh, reasons. Uh, I, I may have been confused with the financial uh, audit reports um, conducted by the investigators when they attended for, for the audit, financial audit, as opposed to what I think he is talking about, which is um, audit data. Yes. Um, so that, that's one explanation. Is one that, explanation. Is explanation. And the second explanation may be that uh, in his report he talks about transaction logs uh, being available. Um, and I may have come to the conclusion that simply looking at the transaction logs would simply get him back to the same point where the financial audit indicated that losses had been incurred. Do you think that you were qualified to make that decision? Absolutely not. Do you think you were sufficiently informed about the Horizon system to make that decision? I was not, decision? no. If we look at the top email um, from Gareth Jenkins to yourself, he says, I've now amended my witness statement to refer to the specific case and to mention the removal of a cash account in 2005. Does this provide sufficient detail? Um, he had told you in his email that... Um, he had no details of the complaints or investigations into Horizon, um, etc. Did you think at the time that that might be something that's worth including in the witness statement? I think in paragraph three of his report, uh, Horizon Integrity, he goes on to say that he'd been involved in a number of cases personally where issues had arisen, so I'm not quite sure how that matches with that comment. So when you considered that statement and considered the communication between yourselves, did you think to yourself, hang on a minute, the, these two things don't match up? Possibly, I can't recall. You, you possibly did think that there's yes, an I, I can't recall at the time. Pardon? I can't recall at the time if I did or not. Would it not have caused you serious concern to have seen such a significant inconsistency? Yes, potentially. Would you not remember? Such a significant. I can't, no. You can't remember? I can't remember. In the bottom email, you say, could you clarify what this means and discount it as a possible explanation for the losses? Uh, do you think it's right to have asked somebody who um, is seen by some people as an expert witness to discount something as a ex possible explanation rather than to, for example, explore it. Absolutely, yes, it's inappropriate, yes. Um, the conversation reads a little like you're asking Mr Jenkins to narrow his report or to keep it within narrow confines. Do you think that's a, a fair...? Um, I'm not sure that's what I was attempting to do, but yes, it can be read like that. Uh, what do you think you were attempting to do? Uh, to explain the issue around the 2005 removal of cash, cash account. Um, let, let's have a look at the witness statement that was produced. It's poll 00059424. Some bits are a, a little hard to read, they're a, mm. a little faint, but uh, I just want to start by looking at the first paragraph. It says, I'm employed by Fujitsu Services Limited, who have been contacted by the post office to provide at the Horizon Systems operating in post offices around the country. However, I understand that my role is to assist the court rather than represent the views of my employers or Post Office Limited. Are, are you able to assist us with how that sentence, that final sentence, came into being? No, I'm not. 
Um, could we scroll over the page, please? Um, it says in the middle of that page, I've been asked to provide a statement in the case of Angela Sefton and Anne Neild. I understand that the integrity of the system has been questioned and this report provides some general information regarding the integrity of Horizon. Uh, there's then a paragraph below that, uh, which says, I note that in the defense statement, there is a statement that losses started in 2005 and a statement that Horizon was installed at that time. As I mentioned below, Horizon was rolled out between 1999 and 2002, so I'm surprised at the reference to 2005. However, there was a significant change to Horizon that was implemented late in 2005, um, namely the removal of the weekly cash account report and the move to the monthly branch trading report. Uh, these changes were thoroughly tested at the time, as, in, as is the case with any change to Horizon, and there has been no indication of there being any issues regarding this change. In particular, the changes had no impact on the overall integrity of the system as outlined in this statement. Um, and, and then if we zoom out, it goes on to um, talk about the Horizon system in general. Um, in general terms. Uh, am I right in saying those two paragraphs that we've looked at, are those effectively the tailoring of that generic statement yes. to this particular case? Um, do you consider that that bottom paragraph um, about the Horizon system, do you, do you consider that to be expert evidence or is that Mr. Jenkins' personal experience or, uh, of matters that he was involved in or what did you understand or do, do you understand that to be? For example, these changes were thoroughly tested at the time, um, as is the case with any changes to Horizon. Is that expert evidence from what you can see, or is that something else? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd, I'd be able to make a determination whether that exp that's expert evidence or something else. Uh, what did you see it being at the time? Uh, expert evidence, probably. Can we please scroll down to the penultimate page? We have at the bottom horizon integrity. Um, this, I think we, we will see in another witness statement. It seems to be part of the generic statement, but do correct me if I'm wrong on that. Mm. Um, it says, this is described in the separate integrity documents, uh, which I now produce, and he exhibits them. Um, I've been involved personally in a number of challenges to the integrity of the original Horizon system and produced witness statements uh, for a number of cases where the integrity has been challenged. I'm not aware of any cases where the integrity of Horizon Online has yet been successfully challenged in court. Uh, the main challenges in the cases in which I have been involved were presented as hypothetical issues and my previous witness statements went through each of these hypotheses and showed that there was no specific evidence for any of them in the data presented. In summary, I would conclude, that, uh, conclude by saying that I fully believe that Horizon will accurately record all data that is submitted to it and correctly account for it. However, it cannot compensate for any data that is incorrectly input into it as a result of human error, lack of training or fraud, and nor can any other system. Um, those final bits sound very much like the requirements that we saw um, for Mr. Bowyer earlier on, the things that he said he would like to be included in a witness statement. Uh, are you aware of how these paragraphs uh, came I'm to not, no. feature? No. Can we please look at poll 00323672? We're now in 2013, April 2013, and there's a disclosure request. Uh, dear Steve, please see attached request received today. As discussed, please could you indicate a time scale cost for dealing uh, with the, these queries so Ms. Gibson can consider the position. Um, and I'll very briefly just take you to the request itself. That's poll 00323673.
This is yet another disclosure request in this particular case. Um, the solicitors for Ms. Neils are asking for a number of different things. And if we look at paragraph 12, it's over the page, request 12. Um, they ask for the set of system issues recorded for consideration by Fujitsu during the tenure of our client across the Horizon system. And those systems, it interfaces to uh, together with those system issues unresolved at the commencement of our client's tenure. Uh, are you aware of anything in this case uh, being disclosed to the defendants uh, relating to issues with the Horizon system um, along those lines over and above what we've seen? No. I'm going to move on now to the Grant Allen case study. Sir, I, I, I wonder whether I can continue until one o'clock today or we could take another break and it might be possible that we continue through the lunch period. Um, I'm, I'm in your hands. We will certainly finish by three o'clock. Um, we can either do it by me continuing for half an hour now and taking uh, a, a lunch or we can take a slightly longer break now in, instead well, of lunch. Let, let's canvas what the people in the room with you, Mr. Blake, what they prefer. I, I, I'm really essentially neutral about it. But if the consensus is that we should have less than a full lunch break but a reasonable break now and then forego a lunch break, if that's the consensus, I'm happy with that. There may be quite a few questions, actually, on behalf of, of Mr. Jenkins, so perhaps we'll, we'll continue going now. All right. Thank you. Um, the case of Mr. Allen. Um, I'd like to very briefly take you through the case summary. Yes. Um, it's a RLIT 0000039. Can we go, please, to page four, and it starts at paragraph 16. Um, I'm going to very briefly summarize this, because as I say, um, those in, in this room have seen these case studies on a few occasions. Um, on the 24th of January, 2013, in the Crown Court at Chester, um, Mr. Allen pleaded guilty to a single count of fraud. He entered a guilty plea on a basis accepted by the post office and the court that he could not account for the loss, but admitted covering it up. He was sentenced to a 12-month community order. Um, if we look at over the page very briefly, I'll just take you through a few brief paragraphs. Paragraph 18, halfway down, it says, uh, he described inexplicable small losses as well as some large losses which had been attributed to one member of staff he denied that he had stolen any money. He expressed a willingness to repay the losses, but disputed that the sums represented actual loss to post office and maintained that they had been caused by issues with the system. Next paragraph. A number of logs retained by the post office demonstrate that Mr. Allen reported the relocation problems and his concerns about faults with Horizon. Next paragraph, please. During the course of criminal proceedings on the 2nd of November 2012, Mr. Allen's solicitors requested disclosure of an independent review of the Horizon system. So here we get into the second site issue. Yes. Uh, Post Office's agents, Cartwright King, responded by indicating that the review was still pending. Uh, Cartwright King stated that on receipt of the report, the Post Office would consider their continuing duty of disclosure and provide a copy if appropriate. Um, the next paragraph says the post office served a witness statement from Gareth Jenkins. And it says uh, this about halfway down that paragraph. Uh, Mr. Jenkins made clear that he had not seen detailed logs to see whether Horizon uh, could be responsible for the losses at Mr. Allen's branch. 
He concluded that Horizon will accurately record all data that is submitted to it and correctly account for it. Correspondence between Cartwright King and Mr. Jenkins indicates that Cartwright King instructed Mr. Jenkins not to analyze the detailed logs in order to avoid incurring additional costs. And then over the page, uh, the post office accepts that the prosecution was unfair and aff an affront to justice, uh, and the Court of Appeal says Paul is right to do so. In our judgment, notwithstanding his guilty plea, Mr. Allen's conviction is unsafe. Um, thank you, that can come down. Um, your involvement in this case, I think, began in May and June, to J June 2012, is that correct? Yes, I believe so. Yes. Can we look at poll 00089426? Uh, this is the investigation report produced by Mr. Bradshaw. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Uh, is this the kind of document that you would receive in your green pack? Yes. Yes. Just, just pausing there, do you have any view as to the abilities of Mr. Bradshaw? Um, there was a consistent failure to investigate the losses properly in relation to the cases I dealt with him. Um, was that a feeling you held at the time, or is that a subsequent feeling? Subsequently. Uh, um, at the time, did you think that he was thoroughly investigating those cases that you were involved in? Not in relation to the Grant Allen case when I had a communication from Mr. Jenkins indicating that he would be able to delve more deeply into the issue about the data loss. And uh, I had previously instructed in my advice uh, for inquiries to be made into that precise issue, and it clearly hadn't been. Um, so in your view, Mr. Bradshaw hadn't carried out an instruction to an advice. A, a, an advice to, to, to what? To look at particular logs? Um, I believe the advice is in the papers somewhere. If, yes. if you could bring that up, then it would help. We, we, we will have yeah. a look at it yes. shortly. Um, but it, it is your view that that investigation was insufficient in some way because yes. of a lack of thoroughness? Yes. A, and was that, and that was something that you had advised on? <laughs> prior to, at an early stage of the prosecution? Yes, I'd, I'd asked them to look into this issue. Uh, and was it seen as important to you at the time? Yes. Can we please look at page three, the bottom of page three? Uh, this is the explanation, the interview with Mr. Allen. This is summarized by Mr. Bradshaw. It says, Mr. Allen said that between the period of November 2009 and March 2010, he had to make good losses in the region of uh, £1,400. And this can be seen uh, in his business accounts. If we go over the page, please. Um, it says, at the, if we could highlight the top three paragraphs. It says, Mr. Allen explained that during the period of March 2010 and April 2010, there was a discrepancy in the accounts of £3,000. Uh, he said that he had checked all the paperwork but could find no explanation for this discrepancy. He then made admissions that this £3,000 was never made good and had been rolled over from each branch trading period until the next audit took place. Uh, Mr. Allen's explanation for this discrepancy was that due to the relocation of the branch, the Horizon system was not communicating, i.e. polling, and the data on the Horizon system was not being sent. Uh, Mr. Allen also explained that for each subsequent branch trading period, unless the discrepancy in the accounts was small, the discrepancy was added onto the original £3,000 discrepancy. Um, it seems as though he, he gives quite a straightforward explanation or description of the problem with Horizon in an interview. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely, yes. He, he'd had a what he believed to be a data loss issue during his um, installation process. Your, certainly your initial advice is at poll 00089454. <laughs> Having read that investigation report, 
Uh, you then give a, a, what is a very brief advice that says, in my opinion, the, the evidence is sufficient to afford a realistic prospect of conviction. Uh, the draft charge is attached. In light of his admissions in interview, the prospects of success are good. In view of the nature of the charge, amount involved, and breach of trust element, this is not a case suitable for a caution. We've dealt with cautions already. Yes. Um, and then it goes on to talk about mode of trial. But I mean, would you accept that this is e even briefer than the advice that we saw before in respect of the sufficiency of evidence? Yes, because it, I mean, it says there, please see attached charging advice for further information. Yes. Yes. So there is attached to this a substantive advice that we're going to come to. Yes. Um, can we, before we look at that, look at poll 00089455, please? This is a draft of the proposed charge. Was that drafted by you? Yes. Uh, and now we'll look at the charge, separate charging advice. Poll 00089057. Um, can you assist us with why, in this case, there was charging advice, but in the previous case study that we saw, there wasn't? Uh, as, I, as I said, um, as I took on uh, more of these advices, I, I developed uh, my approach. So this is you gaining experience on the yes. job? Yes. Um, you refer there to the prosecution case, um, the audit, paragraph two, you say that he admitted um, that his stock would be short. Um, he hoped for an overscale payment to pay make good the shortages, etc. If we go over the page, there's reference to the interview. Um, if we look at, say, paragraph four, subparagraph three, in the first four weeks, there were wiring problems with the terminals, which he believed meant Horizon was not sending out or polling data. So this is his account in interview. He says at four that the, um, in that period, a £3,000 discrepancy arose in the accounts, which could not otherwise be explained. Five, he never made good the loss, believing a transaction correction would resolve in due course. Six, in each subsequent balancing period, anything over um, other than insignificant discrepancies of £50 or less were added on to the original £3,000 loss. Uh, next, all such discrepancies were transferred across his stock unit. Uh, eight, he inflated the cash in hand to achieve a balance. Uh, and then nine, it says, uh, when cash was checked independently during migration to Horizon Online in 2010, he reintroduced cash already uh, counted into his stock unit to make it balance. And then you say, uh, at paragraph five, inquiries conducted subsequently confirmed the non-polled report following the branch relocation showed that an engineer attended on the 16th and 17th of March 2010 to complete a base unit build and that BT fixed the fault. However, as of the 17th of March 2010, the number of days non-polled is shown as 12. Uh, so it certainly shows that there's some consistency between his account and interview and, and um, yes. the facts here. There were at least 12 non-polled days. Yes. Um, the branch confirmation team has not been contacted in relation to the £3,000 discrepancy. Uh, no calls were made to the what we know as the MBSC. Um, you refer to the defence case and you say the only avenue open to him to defend either of these potential charges then would be to deny that he had the necessary mens rea, i.e. to say that he had not done so dishonestly. You then give advice on the statements. And could we scroll over the page, please? Um, you say this. You say, with regard to the non-polled report, a separate statement will be required, explaining in layman's terms why this does not show that data uh, could have been lost during the 12-day period identified, thus generating the £3,000 loss as claimed by the defendant. And you then say, subject to a satisfactory answer to the above query about the possibility of lost data, then I would advise uh, a charge of fraud by 
false representation would suit the circumstances. Um, so it seems as though what you're asking for in the paragraph above is a statement to show why it doesn't show that the data could have been lost. Were you aware of any basis for saying that it couldn't have been lost? As in a similar problem to the one we've identified above, it seems as though what's being sought is a statement confirming something rather than yes, investigating yes. something. Yes. No. No. So I mean, do, you, do you accept now, looking at it, it would have been better to have said... Yes. Uh, investigate the non-polling rather than please give us a statement that explains Absolutely, yes. why it doesn't prove the defendant's case. Now, one thing this advice doesn't address is disclosure. Did you advise on disclosure? Did you provide written advice on disclosure? Uh, no. Whose job did you consider it to be to consider the implications for disclosure in respect of this? Um, again, I'm not sure Wh whose responsibility that should have been. Can we please look at FUJ 00153881? Uh, if we could start on the third page, please. There's correspondence between yourself and Gareth Jenkins. And you say there, I attach an extract from Mr. Allen's interview. As in the case summary I sent you, he's trying to suggest that an initial loss of £3,000 is attributable to lost data, uh, which has not reached head office because of installation problems. Are you able to comment on this scenario at all? Ultimately, we would need to discredit this as an explanation that holds any water. He denies stealing the subsequent losses, and therefore, the, by implication, may be seeking to blame the system for these losses as well. Um, do you think it was appropriate to say to an expert witness no. uh, that they needed to discredit an explanation? No. no. Why do you think this was happening over and over again? I think it was an approach that been adopted that I'd seen in other documentation uh, and used the same approach and it was, wasn't right. Was it a particular culture at Cartwright King or was it something else? I can't say. Um, you, you said you adopted it from documentation. Do you mean documentation from the post office, from Cartwright King or from somewhere else? Well, even if you go back to the very first um, email from the other solicitors, Stone King or something. It's a similar approach right there from the outset, isn't it? Can we please look at the second page? And there's a response from Gareth Jenkins. And Mr. Jenkins says as follows, and I think it, it I'm sorry, I have read out quite a lot this, mo this morning, but I'm gonna read out a bit more. I'm, I'm going to read out the contents of this email. It says, I've had a look at the statement here, and I think it might be helpful to have a dig as to exactly what went on in Branch at the time of the initial loss. I think I understand what he's claiming. However, where there are comms problems, it is normal to recover any missing data once the comms are sorted out, provided it's within 35 days. So this shouldn't be a reason for a loss. Also, there are processes in place to retrieve outstanding data where there are extended comms issues lasting more than seven days. I could just make a general statement relating to that, or if we retrieve the data from that time, I could check out exactly what happened in that case, in this case. He says, I've checked with Penny in our prosecution support team, and Post Office Limited have not requested any audit data relating to this case. She has checked back as far as April 2010. Uh, nor have we been asked about help desk calls, which would probably have occurred if there were comms issues. Is it worth asking Post Office Limited to request such data for me to examine before putting together a specific statement for this, or is a simple generic one sufficient? Uh, note that data retrieval is part of the standard service that Fujitsu provides, uh, but any time I spend on examining the data, say a couple of days, would be chargeable. So there are commercial considerations for you and post office to consider. Uh, now, it seems there from his response that 
the advice that you pointed us to earlier as suggesting that investigation should be carried out has not, in fact, been Indeed, carried yes. out. Indeed, yes. Uh, and I think you said that it was uh, important. You, you saw it as, as sufficiently important to put in that advice. It was uh, a clear, reasonable line of inquiry. Um, if we turn to the first page, at the bottom of the page, we have your response. I think it's just, it's an hour later, 12.50, we're now at 1.54. And you say, thank you for considering the position so promptly. I can now confirm that the case has been put back. I would appreciate if you could add your general comments at this stage regarding the safeguards in place for comms problems to your statement and send this to me as before, and I will refer back to the post office to consider whether we go on to request the retrieval of data uh, for your further analysis. I say so on the assumption that the data is available for seven years. An idea of what two days analysis would cost would assist in that decision. Uh, with regard to help desk calls, I also assume this is freely available to poll and therefore would request that inquiry is carried out. Um, I attach the Horizon non-polling report obtained by the investigator in this case previously. And Mr. Jenkins responds above six minutes later, two o'clock. He says, okay, I'll put together some general comments later this week. A look at the non-polled report shows that the branch was offline for 12 days. So again, confirming something that was said in the defense. Yes. Um, assuming it was okay after the last entry. The data should have been fully recovered, assuming base units were swapped correctly, and I'll cover that in what I say. Uh, yes, all data up to seven years is freely available, and he gives you the cost. Um, so we have unexplained shortfalls or discrepancies critical to the defense in this case, clearly raised in, in interview. Um, Mr. Jenkins has flagged that analysis of non-polling incidents would be useful. Um, you're, you responded, you raised possible cost concerns and that you would ask the post office. Um, yes, there's been a, an email from Mr. Singh, uh, not directly sent to me, but to, to Cartwright King about um, getting authorization for any costs before they were incurred. And did you, in this particular case, make inquiries about the cost or did you dismiss it? Sorry, in this case? Yes. So we're, we're talking about a particular case, Grant Allen, uh, and we have Mr. Jenkins saying he can carry out an analysis for yeah, so you. so I've gone back to the investigator, Mr. Bradshaw, about that. Uh, and can you assist us with that correspondence? Uh, there's an email. If you could bring it up, then it will assist me, yes. Um, let's have a look at poll 00089380, please. Is this the email chain that you're referring to? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, and is it on the first page? That, is it the email of 12th of December, 1254, that you're referring to? 1254. That's the email from um, Mr. Jenkins. Yes. Uh, and then subsequent to that, I think I've forwarded it to Mr. Bradshaw. It's the email above. Okay, so we have here an email from Gareth Jenkins in the middle um, saying, sorry for the delay, he's amended the statement to cover the specific case of Grant Allen, so it looks as though he's put in the uh, issue couple of paragraphs into yes. the generic statement. Yes. Um, is that sufficient for you at this stage, or do I need to cover anything else? Uh, when you confirm it's all complete, I can arrange to get it signed and sent to you as before. And then... We have your email to Steve Bradshaw. And you say as follows. Please see the attached report from Gareth regarding this case, which I propose to serve on the defense. I had asked him to look at the non-polling issue raised in Mr. Allen's interview, and I believe that he had dealt with it adequately for our purposes. 
Gareth tells me that it is in fact possible for him to retrieve the actual data from this time to see what actually occurred at this branch and that the retrieval of the data is free to the post office. However, he estimates it will take approximately two and a half days for him to look at it and analyze uh, what it means and this will be chargeable to the post office at approximately two and a half thousand pounds. I've told him that at present we do not wish to pursue this option unless it became unavoidable. Can you let me know your thoughts before I get him to sign it off? Now, it, it doesn't look very much as though you're open to that possibility, does it, in that email? That's, um, I've told him we don't wish to pursue it unless it's unavoidable. Yeah, Is I've that had a, on instructions? I've or? had to look very hard at this email to try and understand uh, what I was meaning. Um, I've said, uh, I've asked him to look at the non-polling issue raised in interview. I believe that he had dealt with it adequately for our purposes. Uh, I'm not sure that that's correct. It's still inadequate because he's saying that there still might be some issue because of the installation. So although he said, uh, in theory, uh, the data should have polled once it was reconnected. He's saying that might not have been the case because of installation and, uh, and the, the, the process of that reinstallation. And then I've gone to say, Gareth tells me that it is in fact possible for him to retrieve the actual data at this time to see what actually occurred. Uh, I think at this point I'm becoming uh, exasperated with him because I've understood now that he hasn't done this and clearly this is something that was possible and, sh and should have been done. Uh, and then I think I've lost my temper with him and said, uh, I've told him at present we do not wish to pursue this option unless it become unavoidable in the sense of, is, is this how we're really approaching this? You don't want to do anything unless we have to. Um, can you let me know your thoughts before I get him to sign it off? So I think it's become an angry email. So your reading of this email is that you are angrily effectively telling off Mr. Bradshaw uh, for not doing enough? It's the only way that it, it makes sense because here I'm asking him to look at it. We can do this. There's actual data to see what actually occurred. Imploring him to do that and then saying actually don't bother unless it's unavoidable. It's, it's can, kind of, it's conflict, conflicting. Can I suggest you another interpretation mm. to consider? You say, for example, I believe that he had dealt with it adequately for our purposes. That, that's well, I present say ad, tense. I, I, I say it adequate because in the sense that in theory, he's addressed the issue, but he's still left open the possibility uh, of data loss having occurred because of the incorrect in reinstallation of the equipment. You then say, Gareth tells me it's in fact possible to get it, uh, but it's going to cost this much. And I've told him at present that we don't wish to pursue this option unless it becomes unavoidable, as in, I don't think it's sensible at the present time, and, and we'll only do so if it becomes unavoidable. That, that seems to be something that you have said to Gareth Jenkins. It, it doesn't it may be suggested, read like somebody who's frustrated at Mr. Bradshaw. It, it reads, perhaps, it might be said, mm. to it, be... I, I, it's not clear. I, I agree. Well, it may be said that it is, in fact, clear, and that it is clearly telling Mr. Bradshaw that you had told Mr. Jenkins that it was not required at present and would only be required if it became unavoidable. I think if you look at the later email... Um, where I respond to Gareth and S Mr Jenkins and say the investigator is happy with the report. The choice of the word investigator perhaps wasn't accidental uh, and was uh, rather in an ironic sense. The investigator who's supposed to be doing this isn't investigating. So... You think that there's another e email that suggests that the investigator is happy and that in some way it's, there's a hidden meaning to it? Yes. 
I think so. Well, perhaps we'll, we'll look at that email mm -hmm. after the lunch break. Um, so might that be an appropriate point at which to take a, a lunch break? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So what time shall we resume? Um, I'm just going to make it a quick... If I, if I can be allowed by the transcriber, I would say 10 to 2. I'm just looking in her way, just uh, getting a look of some sort. <laughs> I think that's a yes. I'll take that as a yes. 10, 10 to 2, please. 10 to 2. All Thank right. you.